audience, uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me begin my talk by thanking the organizing committee for, for the invitations. It is my privilege to give this talk today. Uh, you are the, probably the largest, uh, the, the uh, Russian con uh, congregations uh, I have uh, since my uh, visit to Yekaterinburg more than 10 years ago. It is actually absolutely pleasure to talk to some of our old friends and also to meet new friends. Uh, the, in the photo, you see that the one, uh, Van der Waals anti ferroma nickel PS3. Uh, they are uh, uh, very thin, actually, uh, from starting from monolayer to bilayer to trilayer. And they are about 50 micron wide. So it's very, very small compared to most of sample you see at your lab. And this is the, uh, the, the two-dimensional Van der Waals magnet and the subject my talk. And as Sergei uh, mentioned, uh, this field has been exploded for uh, uh, last few years. Uh, and, and now there are various uh, ideas of people uh, discussing uh, the, uh, uh, this material in the context, very wide uh, questions. But I'll try to focus my talk uh, mainly on two concept when it correlations and entanglement into the limit. Uh, I presume some of you may have heard of it uh, or might as well be working on it. Uh, however, many of you are not that familiar with the field. So I'd like to use this opportunity to introduce you what I've been spending last 10 years and share my excitement with you. Before moving into my talk, let me uh, uh, make short, you know, say, digression and publicizing uh, one international conference I'm organizing next year in South Korea. It is International Conference Strongly Correlated Electron System. Uh, this is uh, one of the most important conference in the field of a strongly correlated electron system. We're going to celebrate 30 first years of this uh, uh, three decades of you know, successful meetings and meeting will be held on 2nd on July. And uh, and we have seven strong uh, the committee uh, preparing all the UNICEF talks. And, and so if you can, I will be very happy to see you all uh, next year in Incheon. Uh, as Sergey mentioned, I started my career in 1990 by uh, learning uh, neutron scattering on heavy fermions. And as you know, neutron scattering is a very small, uh, tightly knitted community. And as a young man, uh, uh, we had pride. Uh, the pride is that uh, to, do pro to do proper you know, says in less neutron scattering, you need sample as big as your sum. Yes, it was a kind of you know, chalk uh, among the young students in early 90s. That is rule of thumb. And the, these are the samples we used to uh, do inlet neutron scattering on nickel PS3. It, it did Van der Waals, but this time we decided to do uh, bulk inlet neutron scattering. And main idea was by measuring this uh, spin wave, and then doing proper analysis, then you can pin down uh, Hamiltonian. In this case, usually uh, two-dimensional model Hamiltonian. And this two-dimensional model Hamiltonian is not new. And even in early 90s, when I was doing my PhD, you know, there is a wide discussion about you know, quasi 2D systems when you have very weak interlayer couplings. Uh, but strangely enough, you know, it's, uh, I got the idea that you know, it's, it's, uh, we always talk about two dimensional, but it wasn't quite real 2D. And, and so one day I decided to move away from that you know, comfort zone of working on very, very thick sample to decide to work on very, very thin sample. You know, it's, it's thin means uh, you know, it's one layer or bar layer, but also is very, very you know, it's small. And you may wonder why I, I suddenly you know, decide to get rid of all the you know, you know, know-how technique I learned uh, since 90s in you know, doing neutron scattering and doing analysis. 
and, and just moving into new type sample. Uh, and it is very crazy idea, as you can imagine. You know, it's, it's basically you 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 will never be able to do neutron scattering on on this tiny tiny sample. Even X ray is is almost impossible yet. Uh, but there was some reason for my decision. Uh, so to to give you kind the sense of you know how crazy I was in that decision, let me just make a small uh, comparison. Okay, so in terms of size, I, I'm basically you know is reducing about you know is uh, about thousand, and in terms of weight, it's much much you know is drastic reductions. Okay, so this typical number you know is ten to seventeen is a typical. Uh, Number of falls, you know, this is a rise. We consumed the whole Korean populations uh, for, you know, it's almost 10 to 14, you know, this uh, is per year. Uh, to consume this, you know, this is, uh, you, you, you have to, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's a thousand years, right, basically. And this is a huge, you know, reduction. And as you saw just before, in terms of, you know, you know this uh, the, the typical size, it was very, you know, it's a drastic change. You know, it's you. I, I just showed the video of zoom out of, of my university, and that was a kind of sheer, you know, it's a typical size in terms of size and weight. I, I'm sacrificing. The main motivation came from my early training as an undergrad student in in Seoul National University. You know, see, you know, it's, during the during the course of statistical mechanics, we learned this. You know, it's a uh, uh, one cycle solution, okay, two dimensional ising solution, and and the nice way of understanding this one cycle solution is just watching this, you know, black and white animations, okay. Uh, but we all know that you know it's uh, this one cycle solution, and also you know it's uh, in, in periodic, in a historical set, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's this line, you know, it's this uh, mommy wagon of second, and then BKT transitions on an X Y. Uh, bread and butters, uh, and we all know that you know, so our, our our understanding or language of you know, modern magnetism is based on on theoretical you know, this, uh, breakthrough uh, made on this three case. Uh, but the problem I found in 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 early two thousand ten was, although our picture is rely on this uh, black and white you know, spin up and down you know in animations, but actual measurement uh, or Experimental test uh, done for this model Hamilton, at least in that case, it was only claim for Ising using Mesan, you know, it's, it's uh, on top of graphite uh, by Mose Chan in Penn State. Uh, wasn't magnetic material, although these uh, three model Hamiltonian are uh, presumably, you know, it's uh, invented for understanding magnetism. And that was my starting point. How can I use real magnetic material to study this three fundamental Hamiltonian? And these are the units, you know, uh, the famous units, you know, uh, experimental result published in 1984 by Mose Chan and Hangu Kim uh, on demonstration of units, you know, is Ising class for wetting and de-wetting of mass on top of graphite. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we are standing on the shoulder of a giant. So, you know, it's, it's my idea is not new. Actually, people thought about this problem. The only difficulty was in, in 70s and 80s when Kenneth Wilson was working on you know, his uh, denormalization group theory and, and quantum problem. And, and also, you know, it's predicting the critical exponent. Most of the experimental work done on pseudo two-dimensional system, as you can see here, I, Z, and X, Y. These are the uh, quasi two dimensional, but they are not real 2D. And more recently, people decide to use MB and PLD technique to grow the really thin sample. In this case, mostly oxide, but they're having some attempt on uh, metallic heavy fermions. So this is pretty much in a state of art work. And these are the experiments important uh, for our you know, mature understanding of you know, this uh, low dimensional magnetism. Yet these are not really in a 2D, right? They are in a scene, but they are not 2D. The bigger problem was, uh, you know, this, uh, to do MBE or PLD, you need an extremely expensive, you know, this toolbox. And, and there, 
need a lot of investment. But at least to me, the, the in in my journey in this field changed uh, when I came across this graphene. Actually, graphene was uh, started in this in my question. Uh, and as you know, graphene is basically two dimensional honeycomb lattice monolayer. And if I just you know is uh, paint my idea using this graphene, then I just want to have two dimensional honeycomb lattice, uh, but each lattice is occupied by magnetic, tiny, tiny magnetic atom. So these are the three dimensional, sorry, the real model I made uh, using the 3D printed Inesis uh, uh, Inesis model. And when I working on this idea and in is doing some Inesis, uh, Inesis uh, experiment uh, without publishing anything at all, then one day I decide that I have to write something short uh, uh, in this article about my idea, and that was uh, you know came out in in 2016. This is very very uh, short paper, but this paper basically you know is sketch all the you know idea I had, and, and there I called these are the magnetic graphenes, uh, and there are opportunities and a challenge. And actually, my talk is 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 kind of an answer to the these early questions, and the to. You know, it's, it's, uh, put that in, in the physics language. Uh, when you work on the graphene, these are basically tight binding model. But by working on the magnetic material, especially since you have huge Hubbard U, uh, I thought that if I have a real system, then I can basically uh, study this uh, Hubbard model on to the limit. So there are certain overlap with uh, you know, optical lattice. Uh, but this is a real material. That's the one distinction I can make. And, and then we we try the various systems, uh, and and there are many systems as you may know now. Uh, but at least I was uh, quite you know, intrigued by the you know, reading uh, the review article by Raymond Bragg uh, from Nantes, uh, in probably in 1986, uh, on this transition metal phosphide trichalcogenide. What Raymond Bragg uh, you know, is, is wrote in his review paper was, this particular system has interesting property that by uh, changing you know, the transition element from iron to nickel to mangan, you can basically you know, change the magnetic Hamiltonian from arzing to XY to Hamil uh, Heisenberg. And, and even in this paper, these are the basically in you know, his picture, I, took from his paper, you can see that there is a honeycomb lattice with different magnetic you know, it's, uh, uh, spin directions. And the, 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 the gap along the C is quite huge, almost six angstrom. So you can imagine it can be quite weak. Uh, and these are the insulators uh, with a gap varying from roughly from one to three EV. And what we did, uh, well, after reading this, uh, well, I read this paper actually when I was doing post in Grenoble in 1993, but somehow in 2010 and 11 ish, I suddenly remember uh, the this is uh, this paper, and I I dig up and and then uh, read more carefully, and I immediately asked my my uh, crew member to synthesize sample on the first day when we had sample. Uh, one of my postdoc uh, and, and use using scotch tape uh, and then peel the sample and then as you can see here the logo behind the sample become transparent. Okay, these are the clear signs that my idea was. These are the what we achieved in in around 2012. But there were a bigger problem. The problem is with this tiny sample, especially anti ferromagnet. I didn't have any tools, and so. A lot of my initial journey was uh, about the choosing right tools, and and somehow we found that the 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 Raman's is actually quite unique tool. Okay, so Raman and, and by taking advantage of spin lattice coupling, we could study you know this uh, 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 you know splitting of of magnons uh, from one to four. And this splitting is basically measured, you know, it's, it's all the parameters. 
And if you plot as a function of temperatures and thickness, then you see that even in monolayer, the splittings are there. So this is clear verification of a constant solution. And we also studied in other, uh, you know, this X, Y, and Heisenberg and published in these four papers. And one year later, the group in US uh, reported that they can do the exactly same thing on ferromagnetic sample of CGT, chrome, germanium, tellurium, and chrome iodine 3. But here, because they are magnetic, they were able to use mock technique. And using mock technique, they could measure the uh, ferromagnetic signal, uh, in this case, down to bilayer, but in the case, chrome iodine 3 uh, people. Uh, measure uh, the uh, monolayer. And so these uh, two cases of anti-ferromagnetic and, and ferromagnetic uh, monolayer clearly indicate that you can produce monolayer magnetism at ease and then you can measure. And after that, there has been basically explosion of you know, is a lot of activity on this material. So starting 2016, uh, you know, you know, so paper came out on, on, on you know, this transition metal phosphor triphosphide and on ferromagnet. And one year later, there is an interesting report on uh, the, the ferromagnetic uh, the topological metal on, in, in iron 3 germanium tellurium 2. And 2019, uh, we reported that hard uh, ferromagnet in vanadium iodine 3 uh, with two other groups independently. And then there was a report of a magnetic topological insulator in mangan bismuth tellurium 4 and magnetic uh, a stable you know, is a ferromagnet in chrome sulfur bromide. And we also reported that uh, stable chrome PS4 and also multiferric monolayer nickel iodine 2. And more recently, we reported that topologically non trivial anti ferromagnet. And there are many, many more samples uh, not listed here. So these uh, uh, explosions in, in, in activity basically give you a sense that uh, there are huge interests in, the, in this field. At least for me, uh, as people who got interest in this material, from the model Hamilton point of view, I'm very pleased to report to you that a lot of these, uh, at least initial uh, uh, breakthrough, uh, about how you can approach the problem of model Hamiltonian uh, in Ising, XY, and Heisenberg has been done using uh, three anti ferromagnetic material and also two ferromagnetic materials. Uh, I guess this is probably the uh, right time uh, for me to stop and take questions. All right, great. Thank you so much. So, uh, if there are any questions, please. So you can unmute yourself and ask or raise your hand. So maybe I can start with a very naive question. I'm sorry, I'm a kind of outsider uh, here. So you're saying about um, uh, anisotropy, about magnetic anisotropy, so that one should apply not Heisenberg model, but like uh, Ising or XY. So uh, there can be two reasons, right, for this. One is, uh, for instance, a huge single line anisotropy, and this, the mm -hmm. second one is the uh, the exchange anisotropy. So right. what, which one actually works? I'm sorry for naive question. No, no, no. I, th I think this is a no. No question is in naive. I, I you know, this that's a cliche, but I think that's true. Uh, uh, our, our current understanding, uh, uh, at least in you know, to 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 the first law approximation, if I say, uh, is uh, based on single line anisotropy. Okay, but the uh, but I think that's I don't think that are uh, actually full story, and that is uh, why we decide to measure that spill Hamiltonian by ourselves. Uh, but it is uh, uh, the uh, the our, our our analysis so far, and also people around the world, especially Andrew Wild from ILL, uh, uh, in his give number uh, for magnetic anisotropy. So ion, you know, is uh, in a few milliv, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, but your question, uh, is it really a single ion or there can be some kind of you know, exchange anisotropy or there can be even DM interactions or off-diagonal you know, uh, element, okay? That is still unresolved questions, okay? But I think uh, we need two things. 
first we have to do, do proper in you know, this uh, careful inlet transcatting, but we also need uh, people like do doing proper DFT calculation. Okay, uh, I know a few cases. Uh, you know, so, you know, including my my colleague, uh, we collaborate a lot with my colleague in our department and try to understand the magnetic anisotropy. Uh, uh, you know, to address that question you just asked, uh, but. As I said, uh, at least uh, our current understanding is single line RSP is, is quite important, but we have suspicion that there can be some other factor too, but simply we don't have enough you know, experience to tell you okay. that uh, what is more important for one particular sample. Okay, good. I see the second question, at least from uh, Sergei Evchinkov. Yeah, please go ahead. And Jun, thank you for, for your interesting talk. I'd like uh, you to ask to clarify what is the difference between quasi to quasi two dimensional materials, for example, like two plates and Van der Waals materials. Yeah, I, I think that's that's uh, that's a quite important subtle question. I should make sure that people understand. Uh, so if you if you if you start from model Hamiltonian, uh you plate one case and there are whole, whole a lot of units you know, example that can be explained by uh similar quasi to the hamiltonian which means you have uh extremely weaker interlayer coupling okay uh you can claim this is 2d uh to a certain extent that is true but what i uh uh arguing here is uh to do proper to the study well, we all know 2Ds are, are actually quite interesting dimension, right? Because of the strong spatial fluctuations, et cetera. But to study those 2D uh, physics, my, my point is you really need 2D material. 2D means really monolayer magnetic, just like graphene, okay? Uh, once you have those samples, then I, my, my, my proposition is then you can investigate of those Hamiltonians, you know, structures and dynamics in real time and real space, okay? And which you cannot do uh, with cuprate, for example. You know, so you, you never be able to make monolayer of copper oxide, you know, this plane, for example, right? And, and uh, although more recently people tried to produce monolayer of BISCO and, and reported superconductivity on that monolayer, and so there is also a certain you know, this approach from that angle too, but at least that is a, a distinction I want to make between Van der Waals magnet and uh, you know, those uh, well-known quasi 2 d materials. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, a very short, short question from our chat uh, and we can probably go on after that. So uh, Vladislav Mikhev asks, uh, what method what method is used for getting monolayer samples? So this is brief, you briefly mentioned that this is a scotch tape, right? And how to promote yeah. phase analysis of the sample? Ah, uh, right. Okay. Uh, these are quite important practical question. Uh, the the uh, the 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 uh, the two D uh, Van der Waals material have different, you know, it's a cleavage energy. Uh, so graphene is one of the easiest sample you can produce. So scotch tape is a typical, and a lot of sample we measured and and also other people measure, uh, you know, is uh, can be handled with scotch tape, but there are certain limitations. Okay, as you go other, you know, is uh, diverse in you know, this catalog of sample, scotch tape doesn't work, and we already have that experience. So you have to develop your own, uh, you know, this home recipe uh, of this small layer. And uh, in our case, you we uh, we 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 do some kind of combination of annealings and and the spottings, and so it, it, it the depending on the sample, you have to use you know tailor made you know this recipe to produce one layer, and a lot of sample uh, seem to be quite difficult to produce uh, uh, with known methods. So each sample needs special care. And the phase analysis, uh, I guess, means uh, composition analysis or what? Yes. No. Okay. Yes. So the composition analysis is another issue. Okay. So if you have about ten micron wide sample and and, and the 
presumably sample can be inhomogeneous too. Uh, and, and that actually quite tricky questions. So again, the the you know each group have to had to develop the unit says their own method of characterizing the unit says sample. So EVX is one, uh, and then the uh, you know say TM is another. Uh, but the other method you can use is is uh, you know is micro pattern that you know transport measurement because micro pattern can be done on on very small patch of sample. And, and if you measure the you know it's a sample by sample, see the variations that indicate that uh, composition uh, isn't the same. But if you measure the few sample and 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 get exactly the same result, then I guess you can assume that sample composition is quite homogeneous. Uh, uh, that is, a, I, I guess, uh, most uh, what we do uh, at least that is what we what we do at my group, but. If you go to more volatile sample like halide iodine, for example, that is very, very you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's notorious sample to to handle, especially chrome iodine uh, three. If chrome iodine three is exposed to air within a ten second, uh, sample basically you know decomposed. Uh, so, you know, if you have sample with such sensitivity, then even though you make sure that you have protection layer. And and even yet, it is still a tricky question where that composition is still stable. And so that is a quite you know, it's, uh, important practical questions. All right. right. OK, yeah. so then yeah. Yeah. thank you so much. Let me it's continue. Really right. right. Okay. Let thank me continue so my time. discussions. Yeah. Right. OK, yeah. thank you. So, so the main part of my talk uh, uh, won't be that long uh you know it's, it's, uh, if you have questions i'll probably you know it's, it's, uh, provide more detailed discussion but i, I like to give you a snapshot of you know it's, uh, what uh, we've been doing in, in these two question of correlation entanglement and also a little bit about you know it's, uh, how we uh, are interested in this non inclusion physics so uh as i said uh, the uh the 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 uh Choosing right tool uh, for uh, the antiferroma and sorry, Van der Waals antiferroma magnet was a big problem for us. Uh, but luckily, we found Raman is right tools. So these are the two representative data we collected on ion PS3 and nickel PS3. And those Raman peak highlighted by the red squares are the uh, the phonons are sensitive to magnetic signal. Right? Okay, so as you can see here. This P two P in nickel PS three has, uh, you know, it's, it's a single peak uh, get splitted uh, below one hundred fifty k, and that with splitting get bigger and bigger as you go low in temperature. More drastic effect is found in ion PS three, and, and and these are the you know it's extremely useful tool, not only because you can measure these things, but you can also measure two magnons. And this is something which I found quite you know, is surprising. Uh, and and top uh, you know, so few graph shows you know, data collected on 300K, so basically you know, it's paramagnetic phase. But if you go to low temperature, then you see there is a broad hump uh, between 300 and 700 micro uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, centimeter in you know, its inverse wave number. And these are the two megalon, okay? And so, uh, using the Raman, you can measure both structures and and and, and you know, magnon, and and then I found this quite interesting. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, after our work, uh, the uh, Angela had work at Nice uh, by using her more I mean, this is, uh, well high precision Raman set uh, with um, electro mag sorry the superconducting magnet. And she uh, repeated our measurement, but used under magnetic field and found that actually the last uh, peak which we assigned as a uh, uh, phonon is actually single magnon. Uh, as you can see here, these splitting is actually Chiman splitting. So these Ramans actually give you, you know, this data for both single megalon uh, on, on actually two megalon. And as I said, you can do this experiment on one layer. 
So here it opened basically new window that you can study the in is uh, uh, dynamic studies on Megan on, on, on to the limit. Okay, at least that is possible for IMPS3. Uh, I'll probably skip this because I already said in this is uh, these in this Ising, XY, and Heisenberg, we all studied it down to uh, moon layer. So correlation was always uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, back in my mind when we started this project. Uh, as I said, because of this magnetism, you know, this is a generic way of introducing Coulomb U to, to, to real material, okay? Uh, and, and there is a few ways of you know, is, uh, confirming that most physics. Uh, one is measuring optical conductivity. So here we uh, measured optical conductivity on, on three samples over very wide energy range and varying uh, by varying the temperature. And if you see all these data, both uh, in this real and imaginary part, you see that there is a huge change in the you know, see spectral transfer uh, from 10 to 400K. And these are the basically signs of motor physics. Okay, so argument is, although you you know changing the you know, temperature, thermal energy you know is, is as small as twenty five millieV, uh, actual charge dynamics change order of one eV. So there is you know is uh, almost in a hundred you know in a, in a, in a scale difference, and these can only be explained by mode about you, and that's typical argument. Although we don't have clear you know, in a theoretical you know, explanation how that can work. But at least in these uh, three samples, you see that that huge spectral transport over few EV uh, is clear. And as I said, you can do these things uh, on one layer. But having said that, uh, we still have problem actually uh, repeating this measurement on one layer. So experimental, we haven't actually done uh, this kind of experiment on one layer, but at least Theoretically, that is possible, and and it will be interesting uh, one day if we can actually measure this optical reflectivity on one layer. So sticking on this uh, one particular sample, nickel PS3. Uh, nickel PS3 uh, is is uh, is XY model, and as I said, shows a strong signs of motor physics. And the another interesting point about the nickel PS3, uh, which we reported in two thousand eighteen, was. Number one, there is strong uh, charge spin coupling. So this is clear sign of motor physics. The other things we reported in 2018 was, we are very familiar with oxide physics, okay? So you know the units is uh, oxide units usually follow that, uh, you know, John and Allen and, and, and Sawaski schemes. And so if you go for uh, large about the U, you know, then you know, it's, it's, uh, there is a charge, uh, transfer gaps, or if we go to smaller in you know, Hubbard U, then there are charge you know, system has uh, dominated by the Hubbard physics, okay? Or the other way around, okay? So the uh, for those oxide, the charge transfer energy uh, from say ligand to the ox uh, oxygen to you know, tension metal, uh, usually typically a uh, few EV, three to five EV, okay? That's the mostly you know, important parameter when you describe that oxide magnetism. And that tells you that you know, see what we usually call nominal valence, okay? But what we found is, is striking in this uh, uh, nickel PS3. So these are basically, you know, is uh, chalcogenide, is that the, the actual charge transfer energy uh, between nickel and sulfur in this case is quite small. And we originally thought it is negative, uh, but our later measurement and more elaborate experiment confirmed that it is not negative, but it's small. So now we believe the charge transfer energy for nickel PS3 is about order of one EV. But typical nickel oxide, say, it has about five EV. So, you know, there is huge difference in charge transfer energy. I'll come back to this point uh, in two different ways. Uh, working on this nickel PS3, one day we come across very, very strange behavior, uh, which is this uh, optical data. So the data on the left uh, is, is uh, the uh, 
uh, PL data we collected on nickel PS3. So actually, our earlier data collected in 2015 was actually crude, but slowly we we improve our resolutions, and, and these are the, our units. You know, it's uh, probably best data. But as you can see here, there is a clear sharp PL peaks. It's very very narrow. It is as actually almost 0.4 millev. And after our you know, work, it was confirmed by two other groups in the US that uh, these peaks are quite narrow. And this narrow you know, PL has strong temp dependence, as you can see here. So TNL for nickel PS3 about 150 K. And so in parametric phase at high temperature, this PL disappear. So these are the clearly indicate that this PL peak is somehow coupled to magnetic degree freedom. Another supporting evidence for that argument is uh, found in this second dependent. So as I said, the for XY model, the model in you know, its all the parameter disappear at bone layer because this is BKT uh, Phoenix. This PL peak also suppress as you go thinner and thinner. So this is clearly consistent with the second dependence of the parameter. These two data indicate that these axons are not the usual axon. These are somehow related to magnetism, and that's what we call magnetic axon. And when we observed this data, we our initial uh, interpretation was because of this very, very narrow width, we almost thought this is actually defect because you, know, so you cannot have 0.4 milli EB resolution for any many body physics. You know, typical units you know, is DD excitation for nickel two plus is also about 0.1, or if you want narrow peaks like impurity, that can be five. 0.4 is extremely narrow. So we decided to do optical absorption measurement, which can actually you know, test our possibility that whether it's coming from defect. And we found similarly strong peaks, almost same temperature dependence. It completely ruled out that these peaks is nothing to do with impurity. Okay. So to uh, we, understand, we, excuse me, yeah. PL is photoluminescence or uh, anything else? PL. Say again, what, please. Uh, what is PL? Uh, is this photoluminescence? Oh, the photo, photoluminescence, sorry. Yeah. Photoluminescence. Yeah. So these are the measuring actually electron and hole combinations. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so to 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 understand this very very narrow magnetic axons, uh, we decided to do other experiment. That was the Wicks experiment, resonant inelastic X-ray experiment. And the data I'm showing on the right is the experimental data. Uh, so the x-axis is actually the energy of x instant energy of x-rays, and y-axis is energy loss. Okay. So if I make one cut along the vertical, that is basically produce one data like this energy loss spectrum. Okay. And the exton or magnetic exton, I should say, we found is about one point four seven ish. And that's here, okay? And what is striking in this data is this. Our original optical data couldn't actually, you know, uh, uh, be measured with different, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, 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 instant light, or well, you can do, but the choice of your unit, uh, energy is very, very small. But in this case, you find that this particular uh, energy at 1.47 uh, has a clear resonant behavior at this uh, vertical line indicated by red dashed line, okay? So somehow this 1.4 EV magnetic axon is sensitive to the energy of instant X-ray. What these energy depends mean is, so this vertical line, is uh, the position of this uh, B peak of nickel two plus, and this B peak is uh, uh, probing D nine L bar state of nickel two plus. Remember, I told you that nickel PS three has a smaller charge transfer energy, 
what it means is, unlike oxide, where you mostly have the eight uh, electronic configuration for nickel two plus, but because of the smaller charge transfer energy, you have a significant part of this nine D9 L bar state for nickel PS3. And what we found is by, by tuning the X-ray energy to probe this particular B state, you see that magnetic exciton is resonant. So this magnetic exciton is somehow is a product of this I D9 L bar state. So using this information, uh, our theoretical colleague decided to do many body calculation. Uh, these are very hard to capture by usual DFT, although more recent paper from Los Alamos reported that actually using some of the, you know, this, uh, I don't know whether it's subroutine or whatever, they can actually predict or, or at least uh, uh, do the calculation of PL consistent with our data. But at least when we did this calculation, we didn't know you know that it's possible. So we we collaborated with our you know theoretical group to do many body calculation. And these many body calculations is so-called quantum, you know, it's uh, many body quantum many body calculations. And so you are limited by the you know how many you know is uh, uh, you know size you can choose. So in our case we the maximum you know, is, uh, size we can handle was two nickel sulfur six cluster. Uh, why two? Because if you have one, then you, you don't have any anti thermal interactions built in the calculation. Uh, so having two is a minimum to guarantee that you have anti thermal interaction. Okay? So this is really you know, is simple, simple uh, model. But the uh, Hamiltonian we had to use was quite uh, big or, or complicated. Here. But the other big problem was the reason why our, our calculation limited by this small size was even for this two nickel six cluster, the Hilbert space uh, had to cover in our calculation was huge, almost in its 360,000 Hilbert space. And so this was basically in its, its uh, you know, put the limit on, on how much uh, bigger cluster we can use. And then there are about 10 parameters. And so it seems to be very, very, you know, it's a complicated in you know, a fitting process. But believe me, this calculation was done, you know, it's uh, uh, in a way that to be consistent with all the, you know, non experimental facts, including optical, leaks, and PL. Okay, so although we had many parameters, but there wasn't any, any you know, it's, uh, that many, you know, fitting uh, uh, degree of freedom. And by choosing the Hamiltonian correct, and one day I had this beautiful data from my uh, theoretical colleague. So figure on the left, uh, left is experimental data I showed a couple of minutes ago, and figure on the right is actually theoretical calculation done using the Hamiltonian I just described. And and, and you can see here, these important 1.4 EV are there in theory, and also clearly shows the resonant behavior at right energy. And this, uh, the great agreement between theory and experiment give us enough you know, confidence in our, our theoretical calculation. And so we decide to examine you know, this, uh, each you know, this, uh, quantum state. And as I said, you know, there are two uh, you know, this electronic configuration for nickel two plus one in nickel D8. Uh, the other one in D9 Elba. This Elba is actually whole on surface side. So these are the actually many body wave functions because now you have nickel and sulfur. And the ground state is 3A to Z. By examining the you know, this wave function, uh, you know, see my colleague found in their calculation, turns out it's actually Changna's triple state. Uh, so the, the blue, Circle indicate the nickel electrons, and the you know this uh, this uh, dumbbell shell uh, indicate the hole in sulfur, and these electron and hole state are coupled. And this is uh, and form triple state. Okay, and then you can examine the all the other excited state, and we found that uh, these one uh, uh, a one g at the right energy about 1.84 EB, 
and turns out to be actually Chang Lai's single state. And these are the another manifestation of you know his quantum state in in our uh, in his, his uh, material. So the the bottom line is this. So the the that strong PL peak is coming from transition between two quantum many body wave functions. Basically, they are entangled. Okay, one is triply and one is a singly. Uh, I'll probably skip this one. Uh, and so the here is interesting uh, you know, this is a question. So these are the sample we use for our RICS experiment. It's quite small, but it's not that microscopic. This is almost you know, it's five and micro wide. So it's quite you know, it's bulky. And the ground state is you know, it's basically you know, it's a Chang'e triple state. So let me think about what it means. So I have this honeycomb lattice. And each nickel uh, uh, you know, is, is uh, from zigzag chains. And as I said, this nickel sulfur six forms many body wave function. Uh, these are actually schematic you know, pictures of Chang Lai triple state. And if I imagine this Chang Lai triple state actually covering all the lattice, then you somehow can imagine that these nickels are actually entangled through the you know, say common sulfur, okay? So my conjecture or, or you know, it's interesting question is, can we have macroscopic entanglement? Uh, that is still ongoing uh, question we have. And the other interesting point is, we recently discovered another nickel compound with exactly uh, similar physics. The only difference is nickel iodine two is now not the honeycomb, this is triangular lattice, but again, here we found very, very strong the PL peaks. Again, it's strongly temperature dependent. So at least we have another example of a similar quantum many body photoluminescence uh, behavior in two compounds. And uh, our understanding is two samples share exactly the same physics. Okay. And so, uh, in this case, uh, these two, two uh, Examples of you know it's a nickel two plus with small uh, you know it's a charge transfer energy uh, produce this very unusual strong magnetic excitons and possibly quantum entangled state. Okay, uh, I'd probably uh, skip this uh, non equilibrium part uh, because you know it's uh, this slight different you know it's uh, uh, topic. So let me just go into uh, the outlook. Okay. And this is probably something which more interest to you. So the field started in early 2010, uh, starting from very, very small idea I had, and, 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 and came into full swing uh, in, 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 in quite you know, it's a vibrant field now. And as I said, you know, this uh, monolayer a quite interesting platform for two-dimensional magnetism. You, can not only study in you know, a uh, fundamental Hamiltonian, but uh, you can also you know think about interaction with light, uh, and and we don't we haven't done much, but at least other group done a lot of gating experiments can be done too. Uh, it's easy to apply strains because it's very very thin samples. Uh, you can also do the a lot of you know proximity effect, uh, and you can also. You know, so think about doing more. Actually, this experiment is, is one of the very, very hot topic, not only graphene, but also this into the uh, final rise magnet. But let me you know, say, uh, say uh, you know, three things uh, uh, about certain more general uh, physics you know, says viewpoint. So as I uh, emphasize in, in, in during the, my talk, we are very familiar with oxide magnetism captured by these John and Sawaski Allen schemes, mostly in is dictated by child trans and, and Hubbard physics. But what we found was if you go for smaller unit child trans energy, even or even negative, there are certain samples are claimed to have negative child trans energy, then this energy schematic diagram change a lot. Okay. And 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 the point it is. This is actually generic for a lot of child cocaine that we, we studied, okay? So unlike child transfer energy of three to five oxide, and halide is either negative or very, very small. And, and at least uh, 
according to our experience, I, I think this is probably something very important, but uh, we don't have you know, that many you know, experience uh, of handling these you know, this, uh, 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 smaller child trans energy uh, physics. The other one is, is a quantum uh, phenomena. Uh, and these are the uh, work we did with our collaborate in, in Cambridge uh, uh, group of Montesasanas. And the idea is very, very simple. If you have anti-ferromagnetic material, if you apply the pressure, then you can drive the system into uh, new quantum regimes. And this is quite exciting possibility, although we don't have that many clear uh, evidence of that. Uh, the other direction is uh, studying the topological physics. And this can be done uh, as we reported early this year on one particular compound. There are system uh, uh, host this non-trivial band topology of, in, in magnetic system. Right? Okay. So this is probably uh, one of few examples of this uh, topological non-trivial magnetic state. But more exciting possibility it is because this uh, Van der Waals material is intrinsically cleaved easily. Therefore, you can study it in this, a lot of in this, this non interesting state on to the limit, uh, say multiferricity. So we study the nickel iron to multiferricity on, on, on monolayer. Uh, but we only found that actually this multiferricity survived down to bilayer. But right after our work, uh, there was an interesting report from the Ricardo Comins Group at MIT claiming that this nickel iodine too have a stable multiferric state or monolayer. So there are certain small difference between our report and, and, and Ricardo Comins, but at least this uh, indicate that this is interesting reaction. The other direction is a uh, uh, kind of um, reported data from my group. We're also interested in studying spin glass. And as, as you all know, spin glass is, is ex extremely interesting subject. Uh, there is a question, at least theoretical question, as I'm showing here in, in 1991 PRL, how thin a spin glass is spin glass? It is actually quite interesting, hypothetical questions. And since we have sample, we are working on this problem. Uh, so there are a couple of possibility and choosing right composition, then you can, you can use optical tools as I'm showing here and measure the, uh, measure the you know, this signs of spin glass. But the problem is spin glass as in the bulk is quite weak in, in, in thin sample. So it's very hard to verify the, the feature we observe is actually coming from spin glass. But at least this is a uh, you know, uh, possibility. Uh, but bigger problem is a lot of you know, this combinatorial possibility of doing you know, this, a lot of combination between different you know, ground states and also you know, this body and heterostructure. These are the completely new field. So let me uh, sum up uh, you know, this, uh, my talk. Uh, before doing that, let me thank the, you know, all my collaborators. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, you know, this is based on extensive network of collaborations, not only my groups, uh, but also people at, at the, my department, but also many people in Korea doing optical measurement with us and also US, MIT and Caltech. And as I said, we also did a uh, you know, neutron and X-ray experiment, both Korea and UK Diamond. And we are doing a lot of neutron experiment all over the world. Uh, we uh, have benefited from the strong collaboration with our theoretical colleague, uh, both group in, 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 in our department, also group and KIAS. But last not least, these are the uh, my unsung heroes. Uh, the people marked by red are the some of the key persons uh, worked in in this problem at the beginning of my my project. And four people already left the groups. Uh, 
uh, and the uh, when Xuan Sun also left this summer uh, 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 for Michigan State University, and 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 some of the young students is, is actually learning how to uh, uh, work on this problem. To summarize, uh, well, okay, I guess probably the the uh, the uh, small sentence is two dimensional Van der Waals magnets are new material platform for study of low dimensional physics and material science, in particular strongly correlated electron systems and something like entanglement and magnetic axons, etc. Probably the list will go and go on. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to UNESCO's new development. Uh, but before ending my talk, I should uh, thanks to my funding agency, uh, National Research Foundation Korea, and Samsung Science Technology Foundation, and also Samsung Electronics. With that, let me stop here. Thank you for your attention.